live. Okay. Okay, we are live. Uh, I'm going to give this just another couple um, seconds to uh, let everybody get settled and then we will get started. So thanks everyone for joining us. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's see here. All right. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining wherever you are in the world. My name is Lisa Nestor, and I work on the ecosystem team at the Stellar Development Foundation. And today I will be your moderator for our first ever virtual roundtable, where the focus of our discussion will be um, a new SEP proposal that focuses on um, what we call send-receive transactions. So uh, we'll dive more into this and um, certainly all of the details of the send-receive proposal. Uh, however, first I'll give a quick outline of the agenda. So um, I will begin by providing a quick introduction to, um, to everyone about what a Stellar SEP is and the Stellar SEP ecosystem. We'll then move to the send receive SEP discussion, uh, providing a short overview of the purpose of this SEP, um, as well as decisions that have been made to date. And then we will open it up to our roundtable participants to um, start having a discussion and sorting through uh, pending details. Then at the end, we will also uh, try and leave some time for Q&A from any uh, anybody who's streaming in and participating this uh, in this discussion as an audience member. Um, so please feel free to uh, add any questions uh, on the, the YouTube question uh, chat box um, as you'd like. So to go ahead and dive into things, what is a SEP? So a SEP is a stellar native term that stands for a stellar ecosystem proposal. And so SEPs are publicly created open source documents that live in a GitHub repository and facilitate the creation and eventual adoption of technical standards within the Stellar ecosystem. These are standards above the core protocol layer. Um, so these are really uh, ecosystem level proposals and standards. So to provide uh, a kind of short overview, um, SEPs are really a dynamic way of introducing new standards to the protocol um, for the ecosystem above the Stellar network. So these are things that um, really help to develop use cases that are being implemented and tested um, by companies and individuals across the Stellar ecosystem. And as um, new ideas or kind of new use cases are developed, uh, they can be introduced in the form of a SEP to start creating uh, technical standards and adoption um, across the ecosystem. And it's worth noting that, uh, you know, SEPs uh, within the Stellar ecosystem, much of them have been inspired by the IETF. So just to give a quick uh, view of the SEP overview process um, for anyone that would be interested in, in doing this themselves, um, or getting more involved in other SEPs that are being introduced. So this really starts with an introduction or kind of initial uh, discussion. So uh, there's a use case, there's a, um, a type of transaction or a, you know, a, a type of um, operation that someone wants to do uh, in the Stellar ecosystem. And there's not really a, a standard easy way to implement this. So they will reach out and, and start kind of talking with other people um, in the ecosystem, including SDF, um, to get a sense of other people would have a similar desire, they see a similar need, um, and also to get feedback on kind of other, um, other iterations of, of how that use case might work. Um, after those kind of precept discussions happen, then an actual SEP is drafted. Um, and so, you know, this usually comes in the form of a, a pull request. Uh, in the GitHub repository. At that point, there's a lot of continued discussion, um, further iterations and, and merging of the proposal itself, uh, which then will 
actually get changed into a, a, a formal draft. Um, once that draft is developed, then it will kind of go into an awaiting decision um, standpoint where it's tested and implemented. Um, but there's a period for final comments to be submitted by other people in the ecosystem that are using with um, the SEP and it's kind of very early stage. Um, once that kind of final comment period is closed, the SEP officially becomes active. Again, this is still, you can think of as a very early period where the SEP is finalized, um, but there's still kind of testing and early stage implementation of it. Um, and then once we feel a SEP is really robust, uh, we call it, we move it to a final phase where it becomes a, a full standard within the ecosystem. So just to give reference right now for this conversation, we're still in this kind of merging and further iteration. So there was a proposal that's been drafted. Um, and so we're, we're now reviewing that. And so, you know, I think to, to look at the big picture, SEPs are really a ecosystem, e sorry, SEPs are really a tool to ensure that um, we're facilitating an open financial network. Um, they create standard and uniform ways for different types of assets or applications to interface with the Stellar ecosystem. Um, and uh, underlying that is an ability to create interoperability across various applications, wallets, and assets um, across Stellar. So they're really a critical part of um, facilitating an open financial network. Just a quick example is SEP24. Um, which focuses on deposit and withdrawal for um, anchored assets and wallets in the Stellar ecosystem. So this is a very, it's an active SEP and it uh, really has provided a way to improve user experiences across wallets for um, uh, users to be able to deposit and withdraw balances across many, many different anchored assets. Um, and it also ensures asset compatibility. So as an anchor or as somebody issuing an asset, I can make sure that if I use SEP24, any other SEP24 wallet or application in the Stellar ecosystem will be compatible with my, my assets. So very valuable in that sense. So <clears throat> moving into the, the actual round table, um, I'll quickly introduce our participants. We have three companies from the Stellar ecosystem, which will be uh, speaking during this roundtable, we have Anthony from Tempo Money Transfer, um, who's calling in from France. We have Erasmus and Andy from Satoshi Pay, who are calling in from Germany. And we have Bubemi, who is uh, from Calvary System and calling in from uh, Abuja. So, uh, yes. From Lagos. From Lagos. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Um, and finally, we have Michael, who is uh, one of our lead integration engineers at SPF, who will be um, kind of taking the lead and help to facilitate this discussion um, for the participants. So to transition into this, uh, we can kind of start by providing a, a quick overview of um, what this send receive step is focused on doing and kind of some decisions that we've had to date. So with that, I will hand it over to Michael. Okay, cool. Thank you, Lisa. So what this SEP is trying to achieve, uh, we already have two SEPs for wallets, anchor interoperability. So this is kind of a unilateral thing where it's one person trying to withdraw into their own real world bank account. Um, the, the point of this SEP is to facilitate payments between two different people. So uh, as far as the actual users are concerned here, it'll just look like I'm sending money into my other person's bank account. Um, this is gonna be facilitated usually by two anchors uh, who actually um, have relationships with each other. And ideally there will be a, a dense network of anchors in all different regions. So you could send to anywhere in the world. Um, but the important part is that uh, it is between two different end user individuals. Um, so our use case, you know, for example, uh, business payments from Nigeria to Europe, and this is something that Kauri and Tempo have already started working on um, and have kind of uh, used some of our older steps to, to make this work. And ideally, we're going to have a more clear, um, actual, uh, explicit step for this so that when other, you know, if, if a third party, a third anchor comes on, um, they can have a business relationship and then just plug in and not have to do 
technical integrations um, or not have to do anything complicated. It's already going to be built. Um, so we've made some decisions already. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing's final. This is all, I'm just trying to put something out there so we can talk about it. Um, it looks a lot like step six, uh, mostly because what we've seen from other anchors, uh, what we've seen from Tempo and Cowry is that step six technically seems to work for a lot of this. Um, the, the shape of the API, what it offers, um, really, uh, it, it seems to work. So I didn't want to reinvent the wheel and make everybody jump through new hoops. Um, so what I did, and you can see in this, this draft PR, um, is basically take something that looks like step six, create a separate endpoint for it, um, and clean up a few things. So we took out the usage of step 12, and step 12 is a, a customer info server. So this is a way um, of sending it's an endpoint just for sharing KYC information between two anchors. And originally we had used this and what we found is it just makes the flow more complicated. It's easier to just send the customer info with, um, with the first call anyways. Um, so I'm gonna walk through, do you mind if I share my screen, Lisa? Okay, I'm gonna do it. Has anybody here some experience with step 12? Because uh, to be honest, um, I, I had not seen it uh, come up in many conversations previously. Yeah, it's something that, um, you know, and I'm curious. So that's one of the things that I wanted to ask about is, is do people feel like step 12 is necessary? Is it useful and helpful? Or does it just kind of redirect some, some usage and complicate the story? Yeah, so we've implemented SEP 12. Personally, I think it's useful. I like it. Um, it goes back to that uh, original goal of having an wallet experience such that you can do KYC once, you can have it stored in the wallet, and then any new anchor going forward, you can be sure that you have done the KYC for them. So I think it's useful in that respect. It really helps the user experience that they can do KYC once and then they can have their wallet to manage the KYC. And any anchor who comes online afterwards, that user is sure that they can um, do uh, onboard the KYC with that new anchor. And it, I, it just helps the interoperability in general. That's my perspective. Wouldn't you still, have, if a new anchor comes on board, wouldn't you still have to redo that KYC with the new anchor? Yes, but the idea is, or my concept is, you can have the wallet actually store the KYC information once, right? Mm -hmm. And then when a new anchor comes on board, you can share that already stored KYC information with the new anchor by a set 12. Does that make it easier? So actually let's let's come back to this. I'm gonna walk through how this works um, so we can all just be on the same page. Um, Is the audience aware what KYC means? Uh, so KYC is essentially know your customer. Um, this is, informa is information about uh, people trying to send or receive money. Um, this can be simple as name, um, or it can be as complicated as we need a photo of your passport. Um, with, uh, we need a photo of your face holding your passport, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it can get complicated at times. Um, okay. oh, well, furthermore, there might also be strict requirements on, on businesses. Uh, now, know your customer. There's also know your business, right? And then we, we really start opening up. Um, for Pandora's box. Um, so it, it really is a diverse topic. Um, can you guys see this step right now? 
I'm confused as to what's happening with my Zoom client. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yep. So I'm just gonna walk through what the step we have currently is. Um, so at the highest level, there is, you know, this is something that creates a product between, and I might've said this already, two end users. And it's facilitated by two uh, businesses that have rails between each other. So these, um, you know, one of the differences between this and something like step six or step 24 is that this is not a discoverable protocol. Um, any anchors that are gonna be involved in this, any rails that are created, they have a relationship up front. Um, so it's not like uh, someone can just pop up and say, now I'm an anchor in Saudi Arabia and you know, get money sent to them without, without someone agreeing that they're actually a real, real business. Um, so in this example, we have Alice in Nigeria who wants to send money to Bob in Europe. So Alice will sign up with Nigeria Pay to make this payment, send money directly to Bob's bank account. Um, Bob doesn't need to know anything. All he needs to do is make sure that Alice knows his bank account information so she can actually deposit it into his bank account. Um, so, oh, looks like I used the word cowrie instead of Nigeria Pay. Um, I'll change that. Uh, but basically, uh, this Nigerian anchor has a relationship with someone in Europe, Europay. And then they will use this protocol um, to actually transfer the money and tell Europay where to deposit the money into Bob's bank account. So the actual protocol only happens between the two anchors. Um, everything that happens outside of the two anchors communicating is not part of the SAP. We don't need any protocols for that. So when, when Nigeria Pay onboards Alice and collects all of Alice's information, this is just a web app or a mobile app. Um, there's no interoperable protocol here. So we don't want to try to define too much, only the things that have to do with uh, part, parties interacting with each other. Um, that are hey, Michael, can I just ask you, are, are you looking at the GDAC at the moment or on, on GitHub? Um, I'm, I'm right the, now on, on, your, on your screen, I'm looking at the GitHub at the, at the markdown on the GitHub, just, just so you oh, know. Wait, wait a second, are you on this, what you're seeing? what I'm highlighting right now? Yes. Oh, okay. I was looking at the wrong screen. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I'm looking at this. Uh, why is this? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong screen. I had a second screen up. Um, so this is what I just described. Uh, there are, so here's how this actually works. Um, there, there are four entities. There's a sending client and the receiving client. These are the actual people or businesses sending money and receiving money. And then there's a sending and receiving anchor. So the sending client will set, sign up with the sending anchor, tell them they want to send money to Europe. The sending anchor will decide who their anchor is in Europe, send the, um, send the tokens over there. And then the receiving anchor will deposit into the receiving client's bank account. Um, when these rails are set up, uh, each anchor is gonna find a counterparty in whatever region they wanna operate with. And they're gonna trade public keys so that we can use SEP10 authentication. So this is slightly different than SEP6 and SEP24 where we use SEP10 to say who the end user is. In this case, this is just the anchors. It's the anchors proving who they are to interact with each other. This is not a SEP10 key for the end user. Um, so when we, sorry. Okay. Um, when we do all the onboarding and when we collect all the information for the transaction, this happens out of the scope of the spec. Um, and so the, the first anchor, the sending anchor will collect the amounts, the, any KYC information about the sender or the receiver that they, that they need, the bank account information of where it's going. Um, and then that's when the actual initiation happens um, of the, the protocol. So hey, once you, I, yes. I just got a message from someone asking um, if you could zoom in a little bit, it's uh, hard to read. Yes. Uh, Michael. Mm. Awesome. I okay. also, uh, we're gonna link to this uh, repo specifically in the YouTube chat so people can go on that directly as well. Yeah, if someone could drop that into the chat, I couldn't comment from my Stellar account. That'd be great. Um, 
So, so this is where things start to look a little familiar. So now that the uh, sending client has told the sending anchor what it wants to do, we can start this protocol uh, dance. Um, so basically, the sending client is going to choose their destination region. They're going to say, I want to send this to Europe. And now the sending anchor says, OK, I know who my, my Europe anchor is. I'm going to look up their TOML file to get their, their send server API endpoint. And I'm going to look up their info endpoint to see what fields they need. So this is very much like the CEP6 and CEP24 info endpoint, or actually just the CEP6 endpoint, where um, it'll say, you know, I can, I can do a direct send for euros, and I need these fields. I need bank account. I need routing number. I need first and last name of the sender, first and last name of the receiver. Um, and using that information, I can make sure that as the sending anchor, I've collected all that from my, my sending client. And if I didn't, you know, that's the second page. I can collect whatever I need. Um, so once I've collected all that information, uh, I make a, a POST request to this send endpoint. Um, so this is very much like the POST deposit, POST withdraw of step six. Um, and so, so, so this is where we were talking about step 12. Um, instead of using step 12 to, to send the customer info separately, um, we're looking at sending it all in one request. So this is just a single atomic request that says, here is what I want to send. Here is all the customer information. And if I'm missing something, rather than say, um, rather than the receiving anchor tell me that, oh, you need to SEP12 me some other info, they just say, I also need the sender's last name. Um, and I will just try the whole thing again with the extra information. Um, so the receiving anchor will just reject this send call until it contains everything needed to do the transaction. Um, and once that's ready, once, once the sending anchor has sent everything the receiving anchor needs, we're going to get back the, all the payment information. Um, so now, uh, assuming that the sending anchor has collected the fiat, however, that's going to happen from the sending client, it can do either a path payment to send the receiving anchor whatever it expects. So if the receiving anchor is expecting to deposit euros, um, the sending anchor should send the receiving anchor euros, um, either via path payment or via you know, a regular payment where they've exchanged it uh, however they want. Um, but as long as the receiving anchor receives what they expect, um, then the, the step part is basically done. The receiving anchor should use that bank account information that was sent with the send call, uh, do the deposit. Um, and then from then on, there's just the standard transaction endpoint where the sending anchor can check on the status to make sure everything's going correctly. Um, and so, yeah, that's the general uh, flow of this. Um, so a few things I wanted to ask about were, you know, A, the step 12 stuff. Um, B, the idea of uh, refunds is kind of an open question. It's something that should be very rare. Um, but in the case of a bank, you know, once once the receiving anchor receives the tokens, if they can't actually deposit into the receiving bank account, um, we need to know what happens there. Uh, so is this part of the set where we actually um, describe what this is, or is this something that happens outside of the spec where if it's a very rare thing, you know, you just communicate with each other since you have relationships with each other. Um, yeah, before I go any further, does anyone have any uh, comments or questions on what I just talk talked about? Sorry if that was a lot. And sorry for uh, the confusion earlier on the screens. So let me ask about the SEP12 stuff then. Um, if the value of SEP12 is knowing that uh, I can just send, I can store the customer info and send it to whoever else. Isn't that still the case here where the sending anchor collects the KYC information for whoever it is? They can store it forever um, because that sending client has created an account um, and they, they send it over via this, uh, this, this send endpoint. Um, 
doesn't that fun functionally give you the same thing as using step 12? Um, yeah, so I think we need to make some definitions, first of all. Step 12 is useful for an onboarding process, like a registration process. This particular call is not, uh, is not um, for onboarding. This is like an actual transaction. Mm -hmm. Basically, meaning it can be called many times. So in terms of just getting the required information, it makes sense the way you described it, Michael, that um, either all the information is already complete because this is for an actual transaction. And if there's anything missing, the receiving anchor can immediately reply and by saying, uh, these are the fields missing, you need to include these fields. And then the sending anchor can retry the transaction. So this makes sense in the in context of actually sending transactions. Where set 12 is useful is actually for onboarding. Um, and the main difference is onboarding uh, requires identity documents, right? This particular transaction, this particular endpoint you're referring to the send um, doesn't necessarily include uh, identity documents, right? It's more like uh, personal information, which would be um, the uh, receiver's name, the receiver's bank information, but not identity documents. So this is useful in the context of a transaction which is reputable. Mm -hmm. CEP 12 is useful for an onboarding process and where identity documents are exchanged. So one of the one of the things that we were talking about early on is the idea of what is part of the SEP and what is not. Um, so SEP 12 is really useful where you're onboarding to a service from a product that's not run by the service. So this is really good for using when, when we had SEP 6, um, if you have a third party wallet that wants to onboard with an exchange, um, SEP 12 is really important because this lets the exchange collect information from a wallet where the exchange is not controlling the UI. In this case, um, you know, Cowery controls the UI for onboarding. Um, so you, you can use SEP12 if you want, um, but you don't have to since, since the, the party collecting the information and the party displaying the UI is the same product. There's not really a need for an interoperable protocol. Um, if I, I think that's the, the key distinction is that if there's no two parties interoperating, there's really no need to define a set. Um, Michael, could I ask you uh, to give a little bit more just kind of definitional info on SEP 12? We've referenced yeah. it a lot. It's, you know, yeah. That would be so SEP 12 is a customer information uh, transmission protocol. Basically, what it is, it's an endpoint where you can post customer information. So um, let me start with the use case. So what, like, like I said earlier, the use case is I'm an exchange and there's a wallet that wants to uh, do deposits into my exchange for a user. Um, I need to collect customer information from them to do my KYC. I need to collect first and last name, a photo of a passport, so this can be binary information, um, strings, whatever. Um, what this says allows is it says, um, here are the fields that I need, and here is the endpoint that you can post them to. Um, and then the wallet, who doesn't know anything about the exchange other than this is where I post customer info to, um, can can send information to the exchange. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's generally, it's, it's a very simple protocol. It's, um, you know, a lot of these SEPs are very simple. Um, you know, this is just one endpoint. Uh, it's actually two endpoints. It also allows you to delete information. Um, but it's, it's essentially just, uh, you know, it's just a standard that says, if you're gonna collect customer info and you want other parties to be able to provide it to you, here's a, here's a standard way to do it. Um, with no no UI, um, or the UI is up to the product itself. We don't say anything about it. Um, 
but can I ask? So I don't I don't have a lot of experience as I mentioned with the set twelve, but the, uh, there's no way of fetching the raw data via this uh, this set, correct? Uh, what kind of what do you what what do you mean? So perhaps uh, I'm an anchor or an entity in um, uh, and and I'm I'm being told that somebody has been KYC, but I, for whatever reasons, uh, regulatory uh, compliance, uh, I may need to run my own KYC again. Mm -hmm. So I would like to fetch the raw data. If we have some sort of agreement between uh, these two entities that we could also like uh, share the data, mm -hmm. uh, of course, in a compliant manner, then I would, I would uh, also want to fetch that raw data, the, the identity documents, the, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, ident the identity uh, of the uh, natural person, all the documents yeah. they have uh, uploaded. So, um, this, so the way that we imagine this happening now is uh, you know, remember the first step of the actual protocol here is we have this info endpoint, which I think a lot of people are familiar with from step six and step 24. Um, this basically, this is how an anchor will kind of advertise what it supports. So this is an anchor that says, I support receiving US dollars. Um, here's my fee information. And what you're asking about here is these fields. So this says, if you want to do a transaction with me, I'm going to need the sender's first and last name, the receiver's first, last, and email. Um, and and uh, these can be any number of KYC fields, including uh, things like passport photo or something. Um, and then the information regarding the transaction. So this is, uh, um, <clears throat> th this is another way that we, we kind of diverge from step six a bit, um, is we separated sender receiver and transaction information. Whereas in step six, it's all just fields. And that works because there's only one party, you know. With this, there's there's two parties. There's a sender and receiver. So I guess first off, does this so actually there's there's two ways. One is um, this way, the info endpoint says here's the fields I need if you want to interact with me, you're gonna have to send me this data. The second way is um, if you're doing a, uh, someone, someone's echoing. If, if you're not talking, could you mute, sorry. Um, if, yeah, so if you have a transaction that's particularly, particularly high value, uh, you might say, oh, you know, I originally I said I only need first and last name, but I actually also need passport photos now. Um, and then that's where you would reject the first send call and say, um, you know, I need more information. I need this as well. And then the sending anchor would have to collect that and send it to you as well. Um, does that answer your question about how you would get that data from the sender? Yeah, I mean, my question was more about sub 12, like why it wouldn't be defined there also just, just, I mean, at least some suggestion. So everybody would have an agreed standard of, of uh, also requesting that data, right? That might also be interesting if, uh, if we looked at sharing uh, compliance data across a network. But it, it, maybe it's a bit outside the scope of this conversation if um, uh, if we're mainly discussing this uh, this new um, direct payments uh, proposal. So, uh, but it, it was more um, uh, like uh, more in the direction of a, of a compliant partner network. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're saying you want a way to like um, kind of just have shared KYC ahead of time for everybody. Um, rather than at transaction time? Yes, for example, or just, the, just that it's uh, sort of the, uh, separating concerns a little bit. So that in the set 12, uh, that would potentially allow a, uh, I mean, we, I'm sort of segueing into a little bit of an auxiliary discussion here, but uh, would allow for a uh, uh, sort of a, um, an entity that's focused entirely on doing uh, compliance, would allow them to also, for example, provide an, a, a um, uh, an endpoint that everybody would know how to consume um, uh, where they could request the data according to mm -hmm. certain rules. But but it maybe is really not relevant to this discussion because it will be more uh, regarding the, the set 12 itself. So, so maybe we should pick that up in, in uh, a so Can, can yeah. I say one thing, uh, Michael? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, from a kind of European perspective, because uh, the regulations are changing slightly. Um, and Germany was a leader in this, is that basically we need liveness tests on all new registrations. And so the whole concept of the SEP 12 of basically having the data in 
submitting it to a regulated entity in Europe probably won't fly simply because we need to do a, a liveness check <clears throat> on the hologram on their ID as well as on their face. But in facial. principle, uh, is there a um, sort of a expiry date on, on when that, so let's say that somebody does that three months ago and you requested the video recording of that liveness test, uh, somebody sitting in front of an agent and holding up their passport, for example, uh, if you there's, request there's no, the video. There's no, yeah, there's no um, expiry on the video. Um, when the passport expires, we have to request a new passport. But um, yeah, the, the, the issue is that we, as a regulated entity, we have to do our own KYC, even if we're using a partner, we're kind of responsible. So we can't 100% delegate that. We still have to hold, be held accountable. So it could be good to have a third party. And in fact, there's about three or four, like Oneify or some sub or, there's about a dozen uh, vendors out there who all offer this kind of thing. Um, but passing it between companies, um, it, it can work. Uh, you just need an agreement, a data protection uh, agreement between the companies like what we signed with Bitbond, where they passed us the data that they've collected uh, with um, a German KYC provider. And they basically had an API into the into the into the provider. Exactly. So that so that would be be something along those lines. I'm I'm just thinking that that perhaps that twelve could also assist in this sort of sharing across the network, right? So yes, of course, it would have to be with a German agent in your case, uh, for example, uh, or with a I guess with a European agent that would have to do the liveness check. There would be like very certain like uh, specifications for somebody in Europe compared to somebody in Africa and so on. But the, um, if that independent compliance provider partner, um, uh, they, they made sure to tag all the data accordingly, right? So this is compliant with the, this regulation in these countries. It's not compliant with these. If there's a way of, of signifying that, right, then that could still work. Um, however, I appreciate this really is an auxiliary discussion to the, the set. It is related and it's sort of uh, also a little bit beyond the scope. So it's, it's a very tricky to know when to stop this conversation. And, and uh, So I think it is, it, like it's the actual mechanics of it are outside the scope of the SEP. Um, but I think it is important to just know that that is a use case. Um, the idea of having like a shared KYC provider sounds like it might not work for everybody, but I want to make sure, like, I, I want to make sure that it does fit into the SEP if people do want to use that. So um, we, we had thought about this and I think that I think the SEP does provide for that. So if you have a KYC network, you have uh, someone who provides, you know, KYC compliance for you. And the way I imagine it works is uh, every client has, like every end user has a, a token that says like, this is the user. You can look up on the compliance provider um, and say, Here, here's the user, here's the token. Can you, you know, provide the KYC for me and verify that they've actually been um, you know, uh, properly vetted. Uh, and I, I think the way that would work is that in this info endpoint, you know, we would say instead of sender's first name, we would say sender's KYC token. Um, that would allow you to then uh, go back to your KYC provider and, and use that token to make sure everything's on the up and up um, and everything is what you expect. Uh, as far as actually building the KYC network. Um, yeah, SEP12 might be a, a good way to kind of facilitate that between each other. And I think that is a good use case where you actually, you don't have to do proprietary APIs with everybody. Um, Andy, but, can I ask you to mute when you're not talking? I think you're, you've got some echo going on there. Okay. Thank you. But do you think that that, so I guess my main concern is I, I just want to make sure that what the set provides doesn't disallow, I don't want people to have to add another ad hoc API to use this KYC as a service stuff. So just to, um, I mean, this is something that we're pushing for very much. I mean, we, um, uh, our service sits very much in between uh, different entities on the, on the Stellar network. Um, and uh, one of the things that we want to streamline 
um, is the compliance process. So we are <laughs> we are very actively uh, negotiating with the with a compliance and service provider. Um, uh, it's inclusive, and of course, this is something that we hope to to achieve. Um, uh, so uh, yes, I mean, we would ideally want something like that. So. Uh, um, just just to let you know, we're also doing something where we're just opening up. We have a partner who was requested, and we just open up an API where they can then pull the information. And um, maybe that could be a step as well, like a standardized way of pulling that they've been validated. The issue that we ran into is every country's got different documents they require. Um, like uh, we're in, we're working in Cyprus, and they require. In France, we don't require proof of income, but in Cyprus, they do. Um, so it gets all very complicated very quickly. Um, and, like and, and, and this is why we would we would want really want an, a focused entity to working on this that we don't all try to set up our own. But but the, 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 this is at least from our side uh, what we what we what we would like to see that we have a, an entity dedicated uh, on Stella who who provides that service that. Uh, and also works on, on standardizing these and then can go into the nitty gritty of fi figuring out the requirements for each jurisdiction and uh, the different purposes, uh, uh, businesses versus uh, individuals and so on. Right. And the only other comment that I have is that if you look at one of the, the big guys like Remitly and um, Asimo, they typically do the, the KYC at the end, meaning they receive the payment first and then they uh, do the KYC after the payment's received. So currently we're not doing that. We're doing the KYC first. That's where we, on, on SEP 24, where we pop up the interactive URL. Again, this is going completely off topic, sorry. Uh, because with anchors, anchor to anchor traffic, that's not an issue. But I'm just saying that um, with the KYC thing, it might, following on Andy's concept of this KYC as a service, is it might happen after the payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you could share something, uh, that would be great. I mean, it's really, a, it's really a good. Um, it's like it would be very valuable for the ecosystem. I think if we would have an open standard there in time, and uh, even if the requirements change uh, or are very different between countries, sometimes it would still be valuable in the sense that you don't need to start from scratch, um, but just need to add the data that's missing. Uh, so I, I wanted to see, um, I don't know, we hadn't heard from Bubemi in a while, so I wanted to see if he had any comments on this. Um, and then also uh, say that I also think this is very relevant to this discussion. Um, would also suggest perhaps that we kind of make some assumptions around how KYC is being collected for um, kind of like a short term model of how this anchor to anchor um, transaction would work, unless that seems too difficult to do, just so we can um, kind of test uh, or continue that discussion. Yeah, so, so regarding sorry. this issue of um, different jurisdictions requiring different KYC, uh, I just wanted to ask, isn't it up to the receiving anchor? So it's the receiving anchor who would always determine what the requirements are. So if you're in Cyprus, but you are sending through tempo. Therefore, tempo, it's what tempo requires. So in this particular situation, your Cypriot, you're sending from Cyprus, but the requirements would be tempo's requirement, which means um, they don't need proof of income in that uh, situation. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about that. It, 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 it isn't the receiving anchor who determines what is required. Um, normally, we, we do the KYC on who's sending the money. So with um, the case of you guys, uh, we do the, the KYC on on Cowrie and Ertholium, uh, the bank. Um, on, the, on the case of an individual client, we do it on the client. Um, so it just depends on who, who is the client. In the case of you guys, you are our client. So we do the KYC on you. Um, and then, but then, because you're working with a regulated entity within Nigeria, we're a lot, you're doing the KYC in Nigeria, 
and then you're passing some additional details. So we do a just a validation check that the person's not on um, some terrorist list or something like that in France. But we're relying on you and your banking partner to do the KYC in Nigeria on the sender. Uh, now, yes. now, 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 if, if the amounts are a little bit higher, like with you guys. Um, Typically, what we'd ask for additional information, not proof of income, but, um, you know, what, what's it for? Like proof of the, someone sending 200,000 euro or $400,000, and it's an individual, normally when they're buying a house, they'll need a reason for the wire, and then maybe a proof of the purchase of the house. Or with a company, they just need uh, an invoice for the, um, you know, the company might need to send an invoice. And that's not relying on us. That's often our downstream banks um, uh, that require that um, or our, our, our internal compliance office. Yeah, so my question is that in this case, Tempo, we have to follow Tempo's requirements. So it's not determined by um, requirements in my country. You as the receiving anchor, you are um, responsible for determining what KYC needs to be sent. So this question of different jurisdictions, I, the, what I'm trying to get at is the receiving anchor always wins. It's the receiving anchor who determines um, what uh, KYC is required. So therefore, it's always the receiving anchor's jurisdiction. As it doesn't matter what the sending anchor's uh, jurisdiction KYC is required. If you get what I mean. Okay. Um, I think, but in, in any event, I think this flow works for us. Um, Michael, when I talked to you last, there was some uh, information like the how, how would this work for um, a cash transaction, like a cash out? And the second one was a rename, like if the person had the, the receiver name was wrong and they needed to change it or the bank account was wrong. Yeah, so uh, so in the case of if some of the information is wrong, um, I think what we do is uh, we just have an, an error, we just error it out. Um, so uh, with, with, with a, with an error that says, you know, the, the bank account is not a valid bank account or something. Um, but what happens if it's after after Tempo, like it's a downstream thing, we send it to our bank and maybe the bank at the other end rejects it because it says account number invalid. So, okay, yeah, that's that was one of my, my big questions I wanted to ask is how rare is that case? And is that something we want to make part of the spec? So I could imagine a case where we have you know, um, the, the sending anchor might say, if anything goes wrong, send the money back to this Stellar account and we'll essentially reverse the whole thing. Um, this, this creates- So for bank, bank accounts, I don't think we have a lot of errors, but we do with a cash. So if mm -hmm. someone's sending to a cash transaction to say Senegal or Philippines, we often get, uh, like I mentioned last time, I think it's about three to 5% of the transactions. Mm -hmm. The person puts the wrong because then it might person might have a middle name, might have like three or four names, and mm -hmm. so the sender puts two of the names, and so mm -hmm. when the person goes to pick up the cash, their passport says the whole five names, and so they have to call us or contact us and then do a rename. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is where you're acting as the sending anchor not as the receiving anchor, right? And then the receiving anchor says- We, we do a little bit of cash out. It's not our main business, but I, I was more focusing on Africa. Okay. Where we do a lot, yeah. Okay. Um, that's, yeah, that's a big percentage to just error out. Um, I think I think just erroring it out is, is the, well, okay, no, sorry. You can't error it out because it's already sent. Um, Oof. Yeah, so what you're asking for is kind of like an update payment endpoint or something where someone can change after after everything is said and done, but it hasn't been paid out. 
you want to be able to update some of the like information. Normally what would, would happen is they would pull the transaction status. We'd have it marked as error and we'd have an error type. Like uh, uh, there'll be one of two things. It'll be in uh, pending pickup or like a waiting for pickup status. This is cash still. Mm -hmm. um, and the person would do a rename and say, okay, instead of uh, Jean-Marc, it's Jean, it's Jean-Luc, um, and, and does it renames the last name. Okay. Uh, and so currently this solution that like actually exists in the spec is to just issue a refund and do it again. Um, okay. This this creates problems because there's uh, foreign exchange fees, values change. Obviously, it's definitely not ideal. Um, so, so again, uh, with our customers, um, they would expect it to be the same. They, they'd expect exactly it would be a, a giant nightmare if we have to do a refund. Right. We do it. Yeah. Okay. Then I think that's something that's missing. Um, I think that's something that's missing here. So we need to figure out a way for the receiving anchor to tell the sending anchor something's wrong. Um, here's what's wrong. And here is how you can tell us how to fix it if it's a fixable thing. Um, right. So what they would probably do is, is it either reference the transaction reference, the operation ID, or some transaction reference that we feed them back and then uh, send a, a transaction update call. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since the spec doesn't have a way to update a transaction, only to create them, that's probably the missing thing. Um, okay, uh, it's, a, it's a little more complicated because you also have to tell the sending anchor something and that's a different direction um, that doesn't really exist in the spec so far, so. Okay, this is good information. I'm gonna have to do some thinking on that and come up with um, come up with a solution. But I, I agree that that would make the product a lot better. Um, this, this is kind of a big missing thing. Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, Can this be solved with the transaction endpoint? So you would normally pull the transaction endpoint to find out the status of your transaction. So can this be solved with that endpoint? Basically, yeah, when you first send a transaction, it would, it would return something like pending payout. And then eventually, let's say you call it the couple of hours later or tomorrow, where at that point, you know there's something wrong, then it would have an error description. Wouldn't that work? Uh, yeah, I think so. So the transaction object can have like a status, you know, uh, info needed or update needed or something. Um, yeah, we just had a comment uh, on YouTube from Mariano who said, do you think an intermediate status could be added for all transactions that by default status would be pending and then change? Um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to share that comment and also uh, give a five minute warning. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I think that what, what you guys both said just makes sense. Um, have a status needed update for a transaction and then also make it so you can uh, do a, a, a put or a update call on the transaction endpoint to actually change some of the information. Um, I think that seems fine. Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask about while we're all here is the idea of receiving KYC. Um, what I've been hearing most of is that there's not a big issue as far as like, do we run KYC on the receiver? Um, could you guys share a little about what, what requirements you have about the person receiving the money? Um, yeah. Just really quickly, um, from a European perspective, um, for remittance, um, it's fairly light. Uh, KYC because either we collect it directly from the recipient, like if they come to a store, a physical outlet to pick up cash, they'll provide their ID. So we don't need anything on the call because we're collecting it. Um, 
or it's the bank account in a European bank account, we don't need additional KYC information. However, if it was a merchant and we're doing merchant acquiring, um, which uh, we've been looking into, the, we might need to KYC the beneficiary because that, in that case, the, the beneficiary would be a merchant. But I don't think I think that's out of scope for um, this specification. When you're acting as the sender, do you ever need any KYC on on the receiving client when you're the sending anchor? Uh, occasionally, we do. Uh, our, uh, but that's our compliance officer would go to their compliance officer and typically ask for um, proof of the ID. But it, I think it happens. It's a very rare event. Okay. And this uh, is something yeah, that. For us, yeah, for us but it could come on the transactions. Again, like I mentioned, if it's a very large amount, um, there might be additional uh, proof of source of funds or, you know, for an invoice for a company or mm -hmm. something else. Well, that could be handled outside of the spec, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, much the same as uh, Anthony describes. Um, if you are, if uh, the receiver KYC doesn't come up much, um, if it's going into a bank, then it's all handled by the bank. Uh, the bank uh, has all the KYC initially, and it's no. If it's cash, we don't do cash at the moment, but if it's cash, then we collect it from the actual, we could collect the KYC from the person who's coming to pick up the cash. So we don't need to rely on the sending anchor to get that information. So yeah, just echoing what uh, Anthony said. Okay, and Anthony, what you're saying, that sounds like by necessity a very high touch thing. It's not something that can really be codified. For cash? No, for like a, a really high value transaction where you need proof of funds or something. Is that something that can become part of the spec or is that like you really need a compliance officer to be doing this manually? For me, it would be um, maybe the next version of, a, of the spec. Uh, again, each country is different, so it's a little bit hard to codify it. Okay. So, so what I'm hearing uh, from that, really good, what I'm hearing from that is that we might need a like pending uh, like um, pending the anchors to it. I guess that would be um, done by pending sender, pending receiver, if you're gonna check on something that's more complicated. So that that's fine. Yeah, it could be a pending receiver. And if there was some uh, free text or something like this, it could be mm -hmm. good where you say um, a proof of, uh, proof of uh, source of funds or proof of use of funds required. Okay. Cool. I know our time is basically over, but I just wanted to highlight that we didn't have the chance to talk about the uh, our use case yet. That is um, like if it involves a party, um, that is not a traditional anchor in that sense, um, but another business entity. Um, I don't know. Do we still have time to uh, quickly outline what um, what what different uh, approaches or what what features we would need in the in the SEP um, to pull that off for uh, for this special use case, maybe? So I, I'm going to jump in here. <clears throat> um, yes, I totally agree with you, Andy. And I think, um, you know, this just means we need to set up more of these discussions and more frequently. Um, we're definitely really focused on the supporting the SEP and your use case as well. So I think for now, we can not extend this specific session. Um, but we can obviously continue to extend it offline and, and perhaps we'll set up another one of these uh, in the near future. So thank you all for attending. I also just wanted to address um, one kind of recurring question that we saw through our website and YouTube feeds, um, which was in regards to um, like, how do you know the quality of an anchor or does Stellar or SDF somehow vet um, anchors as part of its network? Uh, and so I just wanted to make the point clear that um, Stellar itself is an open financial network, a decentralized ledger. Um, anchors are enterprises and institutions with real world reputation um, and oftentimes real world licenses 
um, and regulations that they're following. So uh, anchors are vetted um, by uh, applications or other anchors that are gonna use those services within the Stellar ecosystem. Um, we have a system uh, called you know, Tommels, which helps, to, uh, helps anchors to publish their website, um, information about themselves, their business, licenses they hold. Um, but we, uh, you know, certainly are working in both an open but also reputational um, ecosystem on Stellar. So I uh, just wanted to quickly touch on that. And again, thank everyone for joining. This conversation is certainly not over. So um, perhaps even, you know, just getting started. But I think a lot of really great insights here, um, a lot of great suggestions. And so we'll, we'll follow up and continue to take things forward. Cool. Thanks, everyone.